Chapter 9 Ain't I a Woman? The Dilemma of the Double Burden Lucia Harris was the first dominant force in women's basketball. With her bruising inside play and intense sense of competition, Harris changed the face and ultimately the complexion of women's basketball in the United States. She broke ground for women's basketball and paved the way for so many other players who are playing today. Pat Summit, the legendary head coach at the University of Tennessee and a former Olympic teammate of Harris said, Without the success, the international success that we enjoyed, without the college game growing and growing each year, there's not a WNBA. And so many times people forget about the pioneers in sports. Lucy, as a player, was a great pioneer. One of the great cliches in sports is that an athlete put a place on the map. Lucia Harris really did. She took a little-known school like Delta State in Cleveland, Mississippi, and made it a household name. In 1975, Harris, a powerful 6'3 center from Mentor City, Mississippi, led unknown Delta State to the first of three consecutive national championships under the auspices of the Association for Intercollegiate Athletics for Women, AIAW. Between 1974 and 1977, Harris's name was synonymous with power and dominance in the women's game. What changes the game? asked Pat Summit. Players change the game. But before we think about the changes, we have to think about high school. And there weren't many black students and no black teachers at Delta State. And it was a big adjustment, and I can remember walking into the cafeteria the very first time and everybody was staring because, you know, 6'3 was considered tall then. Girls are a lot taller now. But then, being 6'3, that was almost like being a giant in the 70s. And everybody would just stare, and I would say, why is everybody staring at me? And then they'd say, oh, that girl is tall. So uh, it was a big adjustment, but I adjusted. She led Delta State to three consecutive AIAW championships. During Harris's four varsity seasons at Delta State, the Lady Statesmen compiled a remarkable 109-6 and six record. They were the dominant program of the era. She competed in the Olympics after her junior year, returning to lead Delta State to the national championship. In 1977, she was graduated with a Bachelor of Science degree in physical education and, after the season, became the first woman player to be drafted by an NBA team when the New Orleans Jazz selected her in the seventh round. She didn't go to camp, though. She felt that the NBA post players were too big and too good. I really thought it was a publicity stunt because I am 6'3 and a center, Harris said of being drafted. And in the NBA, players like Kareem, they're the centers for the teams you have to compete against. So I really thought it was a publicity thing. Harris's decision reflects who she is and why she has been forgotten. She thought her being drafted was a PR stunt and refused to go, even if the novelty event would put her in the news and lead to other opportunities. By contrast, Blazowski, Myers, and Lieberman all played in men's leagues. Harris may have had a better chance than she thought. She was to me like Shaquille O'Neal, Pat Summon said. Just so strong and physical, but great hands and great touch around the basket. Harris played for the Houston Angels of the Women's Basketball League in 1980. When the team disbanded in that same year, she returned to Delta State and worked as an admissions counselor. In 1984, she completed her master's degree in health and physical education. Harris served as one of Margaret Wade's assistant at Delta State from 1980 to 1984, and when the head job became available, she wanted to be considered. They hired a white man instead. Harris was crushed. She was Delta State. She had put the program on the map and had helped bring students to the school. But consistent with her reticent manner, Harris never told the school how hurt she was by having been overlooked. I guess it was just the idea of not being asked. Of all the accomplishments that I have made in women's basketball, I would have to say that it's a disappointment 
not to have been asked to be the head coach of the women's team, Harris said. Harris left Delta State and accepted the head coaching job at Texas Southern, a historically black college in Houston. She moved there with her husband and their son on the basis of promises the school had made. At the same time, she was pregnant with twin girls. The experience there was brutal. The women's program, like so many at such black institutions, lacked much needed support. Harris did not have a full-time assistant coach and was docked pay when she missed a class in order to coach. After two seasons, Lucia Harris, college hoops legend, was dismissed. They didn't put a lot of emphasis on women's basketball, Harris said. The men got a chance to fly places and we had to take the bus. We took the bus to Oklahoma from Texas. That was just unheard of. I didn't think that was fair. That was just one of the things that they would do. The woman's program was just not important at the time. She had three children and a husband who wasn't working, and her marriage was falling apart. Filled with years of pent-up frustration and anger, Harris suffered a nervous breakdown and spent two months in a psychiatric hospital. In 1992, Harris was inducted into the National Basketball Hall of Fame, and in 1999, she was one of the 26 inaugural inductees to the Women's Basketball Hall of Fame. But why is Harris so overlooked today? One simple answer is that she was ahead of her time. Women's basketball came of age in the 80s, when Title IV, a law aimed at equalizing spending on women's and men's programs in educational institutions, began to have an effect. Title IV became the Emancipation Proclamation of Sports. Coaches' salaries improved, schedules became more competitive, equipment was upgraded, practice time grew more equitable, recruiting budgets increased, and transportation and accommodations on the road slowly began to improve. It was a boon to white women or black women who participated in so-called white sports. But the more complex answer is that Harris's invisibility is a symbol of the race-tinged ambivalence African-American women encounter within the women's sports movement. It's often been noted that women of color in sports have been rendered nearly invisible, a reflection of America's lingering association of femininity with whiteness. Today, the dilemma for black women athletes is played out graphically in a burgeoning women's sports movement that has seen white women gain and black women languish. According to the NCAA, the four fastest growing women's sports in the past 15 years have been soccer, rowing, lacrosse, and golf, none of which have been successful in recruiting large numbers of minorities. While almost a third of the women playing basketball in Division I of the NCAA are black, only 2.7% of the women receiving scholarships to play all other sports in Division I universities are black. As coaches, executives, and entrepreneurs, white women have also enjoyed enormous success in the sports industry. In Major League Baseball, the National Basketball Association, and the National Football League, while black women have lagged. And it's also true of the coaching ranks in collegiate sports, According to a study conducted by Northeastern University Center for the Study of Sport in Society in 1995, of 6,881 coaching positions available in women's athletics, 1.5% were held by females of color. Tina Sloan Green, a professor at Temple University and the director of the Black Women in Sport Foundation, says that although Title IV has eliminated gender bias in college sports, the law might have spawned a greater tilt in racial inequality. Title IV was for white women. I'm not going to say black women haven't benefited, but they have been left out. When you compare now that years have passed and see who has moved up the ladder, white women have benefited more from Title IV than women of color, Green said. Sometimes women are fighting for individual rights against men, and they tend to forget there are other women in the mix. Donna A. Lopiano, president of the Women's Sport Foundation, says Green has a point. The women's movement is so focused on so many gender issues that the plight of women of color 
who are in double jeopardy, is often on the back burner. Lopiano, the former women's athletic director at the University of Texas, told the Chronicle of Higher Education, The tragedy of the feminist movement in sports is that in ignoring race and in many instances embracing the exclusionary practices of their male counterparts, the movement as a whole is weakened, though individuals may gain. The truth is that black and white women in the United States have historically been put in separate compartments of the same sexist trick bag, hence women of all races have been fighting an uphill struggle. Black and white women are victims of parallel stereotypes designed to keep one imprisoned and one shackled in a gilded cage. While black women are considered aggressive, loud, and dominating, white women are seen as passive and non-assertive. In 1923, the Conference on Athletic and Physical Recreation for Women and Girls discouraged track and field activities for women, white women, at the college level, this philosophy governed women's college sports competition until the 1950s. Physical educators and trainers agreed to, quote, discourage athletic competitions that involved travel, as well as to eliminate types and systems of competition which put the emphasis upon individual accomplishment and winning rather than upon stressing the enjoyment of the sport and developing of sportsmanship among the masses. On the other hand, in the early 20th century, Olympic official Norman Cox proposed that in the case of black women, quote, the International Olympic Committee should create a special category of competition for them, the unfairly advantaged hermaphrodites who regularly defeated normal women, those less skilled childbearing types with largest breasts, wide hips, and knocked knees, end quote. When Althea Gibson became the first African-American to win a major tennis championship, the white press took surprised note that she actually took a bath every afternoon. Gibson was even forced to take a test to see if she had an extra chromosome. The social stereotypes still exist. Where do black women fit in on the great African-American timeline of sports in the United States? African-American male athletes benefited from the civil rights movement in sport, whose focus on integration and other boundary-breaking rights were extended to or symbolized by achievement and opportunity in mainstream male-dominated sports. Black women have largely had to go it alone. Lucia Harris is emblematic of that lonely journey. On the court, she was a punishing low-post player. Off the court, she was abandoned by a fractured women's movement that featured sex over race and a male-dominated civil rights movement that acknowledged race but not sex. As author Paula Giddings once wrote of black women, quote, We have been perceived as token women in black text and token blacks in feminine text. African American women have not had an extended moment in the sun. The women's movement in sports has suffered as a result. The plight of the African-American woman was framed by Sojourner Truth in the summer of 1851 when, under some protest, she addressed a women's rights convention in Akron, Ohio. Truth, at six feet tall, much like Lucia Harris, was an imposing figure of her era. The woman had seethed as white male cleric after white male cleric attempted to justify white male dominance, claiming superior rights and privileges for men on the strength of superior intellect, on the strength of the manhood of Christ, or on the basis of the Edenic sin of Eve. Despite the minister's condescension, a number of women did not want to challenge them. There was even sentiment to keep Sojourner Truth from speaking for fear that she would antagonize the minister's racial and gender prejudices. One dissenter protested, quote, Every newspaper in the land will have our cause mixed with abolition and niggers, and we shall be utterly denounced. End quote. Three years earlier, at the 1848 Seneca Falls Convention, pioneering feminist Susan B. Anthony had said, quote, 
I will cut off this right arm of mine before I will ask for the ballot for the Negro and not for the woman. Truth was a leading exponent of liberty in both the abolitionist and feminist movements. She boldly represented oppressed women and enslaved African Americans. She was born into slavery and had been separated from her parents as a child. She was sold to a succession of owners who freely used her extraordinary strength in the fields and did not hesitate to issue beatings. She had five children in slavery and left her final master in 1826. When it was her turn to speak, Truth spoke of the strength of women in general, but also testified to the extraordinary strength of black women who had to survive as women and as African Americans in a society that devalued both. She outlined the complex dilemma of race and gender with power and simplicity. That man over there say that women needs to be helped into carriages and lifted over ditches and to have the best places everywhere. Nobody ever helped me into carriages or over mud puddles or gives me any best place and ain't I a woman? I have plowed and planted and gathered into barns and no man could head me. And ain't I a woman? I could work as much and eat as much as a man when I could get it and bear the lash as well. And ain't I a woman? I have borne 13 children and seen them most all sold off into slavery. And when I cried out with a mother's grief, none but Jesus heard me. And ain't I a woman? Sojourner Truth made white feminists painfully aware that their movement, like the very constitution they were challenging, failed to take into account the dilemma of African American women. Lucia Harris underlines the dilemma of the contemporary black woman in sports and the conundrum faced by the feminist movement in sport. If the movement is to be complete and successful, the leaders must deal with race and class in an ever-expanding sports world. Lucia Harris could very well ask the same question as her legend fades into obscurity, even as the visibility of women's sports rises. Ain't I a woman? <laughs>